From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Your number is ringing, Mr. Dollar. Oh, thanks. Hello? This is Johnny Dollar. Uh, Dollar? I thought you went back to Hartford. I meant to, but I got tied up in Mrs. Wendover's business affairs again. Uh, What now? Can you come over to my hotel right away? It's one o'clock in the morning. I know it. Well, can't you grab a cab and come over here? Hardly. Why not? A couple of Sam Costigan's boys followed me here. I think they might like to do a little target practice on me. Oh. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Universal Adjustment Bureau, 518 Spear Boulevard, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Tears of Night matter. Expenses continued, items 10 and 11. $10, scotch and soda, plus a pitcher of ice and glasses. I had them filled, chilled, and waiting when Hillary Fuchs knocked on the door of my room. His eyes were still puffy with sleep, and he had a trench coat thrown over his pajamas. What's this all about, Johnny? You said Mrs. Wendover, somebody followed you, what? I want you to tell me what you can about the tears of night. The tears of what? Tears of night, a piece of jewelry owned by Mrs. Wendover, a necklace, four diamonds on black onyx, silver chain. What the devil would I know about something like that? In her accounts, her bills, her property? You're her business manager, you must know something about it. I never heard of it. You better straighten me out. Uh, Try some of that. (laughs) This is all too fast for me. Okay, I'll bring you up to date. I came here day before yesterday to investigate Mrs. Wendover's claim as beneficiary of the death of her husband. She forgot to file it for two years. Now, you explained why. I bought that. It's a legitimate claim. But I didn't buy her story about being cursed, or I didn't buy your idea that she was on the verge of blowing a top. No, I'm not so sure. I'm just along for the ride. Well, you left me in your office last night. A little while after you left, a man named Frank Scanlon came in and stuck a gun at me and said Sam Costigan wanted to see me. Costigan, the gambler? The same. Scanlon thought I was you. He took me over to Costigan's place. What's this got to do with insurance? Nothing. But it has something to do with Mrs. Wendover. Costigan had a necklace, the tears of night there. He said Mrs. Wendover left it as a pawn a week or so ago. Oh? He told me Mrs. Wendover called up and threatened to come out with policemen unless Costigan returned it. And as long as I was there, Costigan asked me to take it to her. I went over to her place, and what do you know? She was wearing the tears of night. I don't get this. Well, have another drink. Neither do I. By the time I got there to her apartment, Mrs. Wendover hardly remembered my name or that we'd met in your office. She was waiting for her boyfriend to show up. Incidentally, his name's Teddy Davis. Is he after her money or what? Search me. I never met him. Well, I skipped out of there and looked up the jeweler who'd made the necklace, a man named Hannibal Mortuous. I heard of him. He speaks Latin or something. That's the one. He told me the necklace I had was the real thing. Now, I want you to tell me who made up the one Mrs. Wendover was wearing. I don't know anything about it. Well, it had to be made up sometime within the last week, and you've been handling her a business affairs. I don't know a thing about it, Johnny. All right, come here. Take a look. Do you know anything about those two birds outside there? No. Well, one of them's a character named Feely. He works for Costigan. The other one I saw at Costigan's club. They tailed me from Mortuous's place. Probably been on me all night long since I picked up the necklace. Where is it now? I mailed it to myself from Mortuous's hotel. <sighs> Those two out there, you better call the police if you think they're after oh, you. Oh, nothing I could tell the police that would hold them up half a second. Mainly, I wanted to ask you about all this before I went on with it. What do you mean, go on with it? Go back to Mrs. Wendover, to Costigan, find out what's real and what isn't real? Well, this isn't your line of duty. Why? Oh, I've been thinking about that. I don't know why. Maybe it's Mrs. Wendover, those eyes of hers, and that talk about the curse. I got a feeling she needs help in this matter. Somehow she needs help. What can I do, Johnny? Go to bed. I'll let you know what happens. Now, where's your car? In the parking lot back of the hotel. Give me the keys. I'll use that. Hey. Make yourself at home, Mr. Fuchs. Go to bed here. Oh. Yeah? Every now and then, walk over and look out that window and have a drink. They'll think it's me, and that's a good thought for them to have. Okay, what else? 
Well, if they start for the lobby, call downstairs and have them send up the house man and get the police. I don't think they will, but remember that. Well, why would they want... They still think I've got that piece of jewelry on me. We shook up another drink, and I borrowed Fuchs's trench coat and left. I found his green Chevy without too much trouble, since there weren't too many cars out in the lot that time of morning. I looked at my watch, and it said 2.35. I drove around front past the two hoodlums, still keeping up their silent vigil, and found a street that looked familiar. Twenty minutes later, I was in the parking lot beside Elise Wendover's apartment building. It was still dark, still foggy, and too late I found out too crowded. Somehow, the pair of hoodlums were waiting for me after all. Hey, this is him, Feely. Got a match, Dollar? Toby asked you if you got a match. He's a dummy, Toby. Don't answer. Got a match, Dollar? What'd I tell you? He's a dummy boy. You don't look like no dummy boy. You're nearsighted. Take your hands off. He's a dummy, all right, ain't you, Dollar? See, Toby? I told him about you being nearsighted and he wouldn't answer. He don't talk. Go on, smart boy. Tell Toby how sorry you are about him being nearsighted. Talk. I heard you talk before. I told you he was a dummy. Hey, uh, tell me something, dummy. All insurance guys like you. Toby asked you a question. He wants to know if all insurance guys are like you. I don't like him. He asked questions and he ain't told us nothing. Hey, uh, maybe we find out something we went through his pockets, huh? Yeah, yeah. Even a dummy's got pockets. Ain't that right, dummy? Hold him, Toby. Yeah. All right, boys, you played the scene good, and I'll see what I can do for you, but I haven't got the necklace. Hey, he talks. Yeah, yeah, you make him talk again, Toby. Now, don't make him talk too much. We know if the stuff ain't on him, it's in his room. We can pick it up anytime. <laughs> That's it. Easy, Toby, easy. <laughs> Oh, he talks real nice, Feely, but he don't say much. Hey, you think maybe he's tough? Could be. No, I wasn't. And I didn't feel like talking in that quiet little parking lot where the only noise was them pounding on me. I told them I didn't have the necklace anymore, but they didn't care about that. They wanted to find out the hard way, the hard way for me. I remember trying to wake up a couple of times. I dreamed I was driving along in a big Cadillac. Frank Scanlon was on one side of me, Sam Costigan on the other. Hannibal Mortuous was in the front seat. He had his jeweler's glass out, looking at the tears of night. I tried to see who was behind the steering wheel, and I gave that up because the steering wheel was a roulette wheel. Then we had a blowout, and the whole car vanished with everybody screaming, Demortuous, Demortuous. Somewhere around six in the morning, I began to get a feeling several feelings, and all of them hurt. It just turned dawn, and I rolled over on my side to watch a man who hadn't seen me step into his car with a fresh shave and a fishing pole, pull out of the lot and disappear. Somewhere, vaguely, I heard the sounds of early morning traffic. A streetcar clang somewhere. Nothing much happened for a while. Then it came to me it might be a good idea to get on my feet and find a telephone and get hold of a doctor and see how long I had to live. Somehow I managed by holding onto a fence and stumbling against cars to make the front entrance to Elise Wendover's house. I made the elevator, self-service my way up to the ninth floor, and staggered toward 913. <laughs> I would have been better off in the parking lot. Elise Wendover was there, sitting in a large chair by the window. She still wore the black strapless dress and ermine piece she'd had on the night before. The drapes were drawn, the door was slightly open. Light from the hall seeped in. She had a telephone on her lap. The receiver was off, held idly in one hand. She looked at me. <laughs> but she was looking at nothing. Oh. Hello. Hello. Oh, Mr. Dollar, it's you. You've been in an accident. You're hurt. I don't think you'll need this. Oh. Well, then, Mr. Dollar. Well, then... I suppose you've met some people tonight who know a great deal about me. A gambler? A jeweler? Did they tell you about Teddy Davis? He's really a dear, Mr. Dollar. Quite the nicest boy I've met since Noah died on the boat. Noah and I had so many things together, Mr. Dollar. I do think he enjoyed being alive with me. I mean, I cried when Noah died. 
I really did. I cried like a little baby. Of course, I cried when I heard my brother was killed in Korea and when Daddy died in his office with a heart attack. I shouldn't really cry anymore. I mean, after all, I am cursed. I told you that. Yes, I told you I didn't believe it. There's no such thing. But there is. You'll see. Mrs. Wendover. Now I have Teddy. He's really a dear. I do think he will be a very prominent artist someday. He paints you. No? Teddy asked me to marry him tonight. That's nice. You marry him. And Teddy isn't interested in my money. Could you believe that? What is my mom? <laughs> I can't seem to get my tongue adjusted to my mouth. Did that ever happen to you, Mr. Todd? Yes, sometimes. Perhaps I should see a correctionist. I, I'm glad you came by again, Mr. Dollar. I told you once that sometimes, sometimes it means an awfully, awfully lot to speak to someone. Mr. Costigan. Mr. What? Mayor. What about Mr. Costigan? Later. 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 I know it must be strange to you, but... But, 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 but some people live for nothing but money and some people to die for it. Stop it. Stop it. Now tell me what's happened. Tell me what's happened so I can help you. They do look so funny. They're so very funny. I've seen them count money so often and so much money and I really believe that it's honestly all they live for. Only, only, only. <laughs> she pointed across the darkened room. Her black eyes glistened with no semblance of reason left in them. It took me five seconds to find the light switch. Stretched out on the floor of her apartment. They look funny, all right. Feely and Toby. Both of them as dead as you can get. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's final intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, the tears of night come home. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. Ha <laughs> ha